what a blessed and glorious day. And I mean that so sincerely. It's an honor to come back home to Holy Apostles, where I first arrived 28 years ago and graduated 24 years ago, as Father Peter said, during the great Jubilee year 2000. Dear Very Reverend Fathers Martin Rooney and President Rector Peter Kusher, and Reverend Fathers, Deacons, Brothers, and Sisters, members of the Board of Directors, esteemed faculty, donors, and benefactors, graduates, family, and friends. Again, it is a true honor, this ability of mine today, to be able to address this 2024 graduating class of Holy Apostles College and Seminary. My own alma mater, where I said I graduated 24 years ago, precisely on May 5th, tomorrow's the anniversary, during the great Jubilee year 2000 as a deacon, having completed my fourth and final year of theology training, which earned me the dual degrees of Master of Divinity and Master of Arts. I was ordained a priest one month and five days later on June 10th. I am honored also to receive this honorary doctorate in moral theology, and I am truly, truly humbled by it. So thank you all. All that said, all that said, please know that I address you today all of you today, as a cleric, not as an academic. Indeed, I speak to you now today as a preacher, not as a teacher. Yet in two very certain respects, these two different vocations share a very common ideal, and that is to defend truth and faith as our Catholic calling, and to also do those two things, defend truth and faith as our Catholic calling, with great love. This is a message for all of us, but in a very particular way for our graduates. In fact, and this is just one example, our sacraments of baptism and confirmation sustained by regular reception of the Eucharist and confession, whether one be married or single or widow or in holy orders, or if one be in consecrated religious life as a brother or sister, even if one be a candidate for the sacrament of the anointing of the sick, living this sacramental economy of the church, and we all want an economy to be strong, right? Living what the church calls this sacramental economy is just one example of defending truth and faith as our Catholic call. Think about it. Those three sacraments of initiation, baptism, Eucharist, and confirmation, those two sacraments of vocation and mission, matrimony and holy orders, matrimony for physical life, holy orders for the spiritual life, and the two sacraments of healing for the body-soul composite that we are, the anointing of the sick, and holy confession. So again, this sacramental economy is just one example of the need to defend truth and faith. From the Second Vatican Council's decree on the missionary activity of the church, we read these words, quote, Every disciple of Christ is responsible in his or her own measure for the spread of the faith. In other words, according to each one's own proper vocation and state of mind. Again, every disciple of Christ is responsible in his or her own measure for the spread of the faith. And from the Second Vatican Council's decree on the apostolate of the laity, we hear these words, quote, Upon all Christians rests the noble obligation of working to bring all people throughout the world to hear and accept the divine message of salvation. Two fantastic quotes from the Second Vatican Council, which I love so dearly, those beautiful 16 documents, exhorting us to defend truth and faith always in evangelization, the call of Holy Apostles College and Seminary, in the Gospel of John 18, 37, Jesus says to Pontius Pilate, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And Pilate retorts, truth, what is truth? And of course, Jesus states in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He is the truth, along with the way of life, but he is the truth. 
2 Corinthians 13, 8, we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the sake of the truth. What a great bumper sticker, huh? We cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the sake of the truth. St. Thomas Aquinas, who I love dearly, says, errors perish and cease to be when people get to know the truth. Amen to that, especially in 2024. Errors perish and cease to be when people get to know the truth. St. Edith Stein, St. Teresa Benedict of the Cross, the great Carmelite Auschwitz martyr says, do not accept anything as the truth if it lacks love and do not accept anything as love which lacks the truth. Why? Because one without the other becomes a destructive lie. Wow. The wisdom of the saints. Pope Francis says, truth according to the Christian faith is God's love for us in Jesus Christ. Therefore, truth is a relationship with a person, a divine person, the second person of the most holy trinity. Pope St. Gregory the Great, anyone who does not love the truth simply has not yet come to know it. And again, St. Edith Stein, God is truth, and whoever seeks the truth is seeking God, whether they know this or not. What a great patrimony of quotes regarding the truth, huh? You know, worth noting in regard to truth and defending it is that before beginning a very controversial church council, that is the heavily pro-Arian Council of Milan in 355 AD, St. Eusebius, the church father, a staunch opponent of Arianism, insisted that all the bishops present first attest to the truth by jointly signing their agreement by signature to the Nicene Creed, which had been formally defined by the church 30 years earlier in 325 AD and which professes some 40 plus truths of our one holy Catholic and apostolic faith. In other words, St. Eusebius was saying this to the bishops, gentlemen, we're here to debate Arianism, fine. But we, before we begin that debate, let's remember what we did 30 years earlier and sign our signatures to these truths. And they did. And Arianism was stomped out. And thank the triune Godhead for that. Arianism denied that Christ was consubstantial with the Father. The great Southern author, Flannery O'Connor, pretty much sums up everything I've said up to this point with this quote. She says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you very odd. <laughs> you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you very odd. The great Southern author, huh? Many called her from a scholar, scholarly point of view, many called her a, a, a southern grotesque writer or a southern gothic writer. And she would say, no, uh -uh, I'm neither. I'm a Christian realist is what I am. And she gave her characters in her books, especially her short stories, she gave them the opportunity to accept faith or reject it with free will, to accept truth or to reject it with their free will. And some of them, her characters, especially again in her short stories, they accept both truth and faith, some do not. And there's often a tragedy if they do not. A very, very telling author, she was a daily communicant, loved her Catholic faith dearly. And she died of lupus at only age 39. She once had a woman write her a letter very short to the point. And the letter simply said, Dear Flannery, your new collection of short stories that was just released, I bought and purchased and it left a very, very bad taste in my mouth. And Flannery wrote back to the woman, you weren't supposed to eat it. <laughs> and it gives you an idea of her, of her humor, her orthodoxy, and her love for faith and truth. Monsignor Charles Pope, who I personally believe is one of the greatest writers today in the church in the United States, he's a pastor in Washington, DC. He says, quote, this is what authentic love does. It speaks the truth and warns of error. This is what authentic love does. It speaks the truth and warns of error. You know, it's a fact of history that Holy Mother Church, the Bride of Christ, goes through particular trials and tribulations in what is seemingly 500-year intervals, correct? 
up until around the age of 500 AD, we have the great Christological and Gnostic heresies against the second and third persons of the Spirit, really, the second and third persons of the Trinity. In 1054, right after the year 1000, we have the great split between East and West, not so much over uh, truth or doctrine, but over jurisdiction. Constantinople versus Rome, Rome versus Constantinople. In the 1500s, we had the Protestant Reformation. And now in the 2000s, 24 years in, we have the great heresies of secular humanism and relativism. But as Catholics, we know that we have sacred scripture, sacred tradition, and the magisterium to guide us in truth and faith. And these are safeguarded by what's called the deposit of faith. For example, the 40 plus truths in the Nicene Creed that we pray together every Sunday at Mass. Huh? The Catechism of the Catholic Church tells us exactly what the deposit of faith is, and it says this. The deposit of faith is that heritage of the faith contained in sacred scripture, tradition, and handed on in the church from the time of the apostles, from which the magisterium, the teaching office of the church, draws all that it proposes for belief as being divinely revealed by God so that we may be faithful and adhere to these, scripture, tradition, the magisterium, so as to put ourselves individually on the path of salvation, as Philippians 2.12 says, work out your salvation. And I love number 890 of the catechism, which tells us something just about the magisterium, the teaching office of the church. Another great bumper sticker, if it wasn't so long, listen to this. The task of the magisterium of the church that is, her teaching office, rooted in the apostolic college, is to preserve God's people from deviations and defections from the faith in order to guarantee them the objective possibility of professing the one true faith without error. That is powerful. The task of the magisterium of the church is to preserve God's people from deviations and defections in order to guarantee them the objective possibility of professing the one true faith without error. This mission of the magisterium is linked to the definitive nature of the covenant established by God with his people in Jesus Christ, God incarnate in his second divine personage. And faith is told to us to be this in the catechism. It's a gift of God given to the individual and a human act by which the person gives back to God their personal adherence to what God has revealed to that person and invites the person's response back. In other words, the person freely assents to the whole truth, again, rooted in scripture, tradition, and the magisterium that God has revealed through that sacred deposit of faith. It is this revelation which the church proposes for our belief, and which we know through, again, scripture, tradition, the magisterium. We profess every Sunday in the creed with those 40 plus truths. We celebrate in the seven sacraments in their three categories. We live by right conduct, pursuing virtue, and the twofold commandment of charity, to love God and neighbor. And we respond to all these beautiful things in our daily prayer and hopefully through these things grow in the theological virtue of faith, which is an obligation that flows from the first of the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not have strange gods before me. Romans 1 says, the gospel is the power of God leading everyone who believes in it to salvation. For in the gospel is revealed the justice of God, which begins and ends with faith. The just one will live by faith. My third and final quote from St. Edith Stein, St. Teresa Benedicta, again the great Carmelite Auschwitz martyr. She says, living faith is the firm conviction that God exists, the acceptance as truth of all that has been revealed by Almighty God, and a loving readiness to be led by his divine will. Again, faith is a gift from God to the individual, which the individual gives back to God by their free assent. I close with this, a wonderful example. Abby Johnson, 
a former abortion facility director turned pro-life activist who now helps specifically abortion facility staff leave that industry. The popular 2019 movie Unplanned is about her conversion, says this, and I quote, I don't think I would be at the place that I am now on this healing journey if it hadn't been for the Catholic Church. Such things as the seven sacraments, Eucharistic adoration, and the Church's explicit teachings on God's mercy and forgiveness have helped me immensely. I know this, the Catholic Church helps people to understand the reality of sin and how to be free of it and pursue a life of virtue and grace. My friends, Fulton Sheen says, Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. He continues and he says, without the way, there is no going. Without the truth, there is no knowing. And without the life, there is no living. And so our goal, my dear brothers and sisters, everyone in this beautiful chapel, but in a very special way, the graduates, as they take their degrees today and go out into the midst of the modern world and live those two mandates that I gave you earlier from the Second Vatican Council, to defend truth and faith as our Catholic calling. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for the honorary degree. God bless.